All right, on to the various parts of the health regulatory framework in Ontario. This is generally referred to by the name of its largest legislative component, the Regulated Health Professions Act, or the RHPA. An important characteristic of the RHPA model is its goal of establishing a common or shared regulatory scheme for all the health professions that are regulated by the model. Looking at the various components will help us better understand how they fit together and establish a model that provides a relatively consistent framework for regulating Ontario health professions. This will also help us to understand the benefits of the model in promoting the public interest by establishing common expectations for those who are regulated under the legislation and for the public who have concerns about regulated health professions. We need to consider the Regulated Health Professions Act, or the RHPA, the regulations under the RHPA, Schedule 1, which is the Self-Governing Health Professions, Schedule 2, which is the Health Professions Procedural Code, or the HPEPC, the profession-specific acts, the regulations under the profession-specific acts, the bylaws under the profession-specific acts, standards of practice, and finally, guidelines. The RHPA is the first piece of the model. Its provisions apply broadly to a variety of different stakeholders, including government, health colleges, registered health professionals, and the public. The RHPA does not actually regulate health professions, rather it helps establish the infrastructure and the rules on which the regulatory scheme is based. Some of the most important functions of the RHPA include the deeming of the health professions procedural code to be a part of every profession specific act, the setting out of the minister's responsibility to administer the act and provide the authority to do this to establish agencies such as the Health Professions Regulatory Advisory Council and the Health Professions Appeal and Review Board that assist in administering the model. Establishing the Controlled Acts model by defining inherently risky healthcare interventions, by prohibiting their performance, and by providing exception and exemption provisions. By establishing confidentiality rules for the administration of the Act, and by providing the government with the authority to make the regulations to administer the Act. The Act also sets out two schedules. Schedule 1 is called the Self-Governing Health Professions. It indicates which health professions are self-regulated under the RHPA and the college they belong to. The second schedule is the Health Professions Procedural Code. The code lays out all the common regulatory rules and processes for all the regulated health professions in Ontario. The RHPA contains the authority for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to make regulations that clarify and expand some of the provisions defined in the Act. There are three regulations that regulators should be aware of. The Controlled Acts Regulation, OREG 107-96, does two important things in relation to the Controlled Acts listed in the RHPA. It defines or prescribes the forms of energy that are controlled, and this is really important because the prohibition on ordering or applying forms of energy is dependent on the definitions included in this regulation. If there were no regulation, no one could order or apply these forms of energy. And it provides a long and detailed list of exemptions from the restrictions on performing controlled acts. There are many kinds of exemptions that range from those being based on a member of a particular health profession to exemptions that are based on a particular kind or subcategory of authorized activity. Health regulatory colleges need to pay special attention to these exemptions as they help both colleges and their members understand who's actually permitted to perform controlled acts using exemptions. Funding for therapy or counseling for patients sexually abused by members, also known as OREG 5994, provides additional detail for administering colleges' programs to fund therapy or counseling for patients who were sexually abused by members of health professions. The regulation indicates the maximum amount of funding that's available to patients who were abused. This is done using a formula based on payments made by the Ontario Health Insurance Plan and it defines the period of time when the funding may be provided. Again, it's important for regulatory colleges to be aware of the provisions as they define the amount of money colleges must provide for the therapy and when it is provided. Certificates of Authorization, or OREG 3902, really only relates to professional corporation. This regulation defines the rules professional corporations owned by college members must comply with to get certificates of authorization to allow them to practice the profession. Schedule 1 to the Regulated Health Professions Act is called Self-Governing Health Professions. This schedule is the list of health professions in Ontario that are regulated under the RHPA model. 
and the profession-specific acts that define their rights and obligation. The list includes 21 profession-specific acts that govern at least 23 different health professions. Two statutes govern more than one profession. An additional five profession-specific acts were added to the legislation recently to govern an additional six professions. Schedule 1 is useful because it allows colleges, members of professions, and the public to determine the professions that are regulated. Schedule 2, the Health Professions Procedural Code, is perhaps the single most important component of the RHPA model. It lays out the common rights, obligations, and processes that govern all the professions equally. This is accomplished through the deeming provision, which makes the code a part of every profession-specific act. The code also sets out the common objects, or the goals, for all regulated health profession colleges. An important part of the objects is that they must be carried out by colleges with a duty to serve and protect the public interest. The code also sets out the common processes for the regulation of all the professions governed by the RHPA. In other words, the key regulatory processes defined in the code, including registration, complaints and reports, discipline, incapacity, quality assurance, and patient relations, apply equally to all colleges. The code gives colleges the authority to approve regulations that must be passed by the government and bylaws that do not need government approval. The regulation and bylaw making authority in the code is broad and ranges from the authority to make prescriptive regulations defining things like professional misconduct all the way to bylaws that define a college's banking practices. Every proposed regulation a college develops must be circulated to all members at least 60 days before it's approved by council. Bylaws proposed under some of the bylaw making authorities, generally those that relate to imposing obligations on members, have a similar requirement. The code also sets out obligations for mandatory reports, including reports of sexual abuse by regulated health professions, reports by operators of facilities of members who are incompetent, incapacitated or who have sexually abused a patient, reports by employers or partners who revoke or suspend privileges or dissolve partnerships due to misconduct, incompetence or incapacity, and self-reports by members who have been found guilty of offenses or if they have a finding of professional negligence or malpractice. Let's talk about profession-specific acts now. These acts are the pieces of legislation that actually govern most of the activities of regulated health professions. They are typically named after the professional activity of the professions they govern. However, in some cases the laws govern multiple professions. Profession-specific acts are brief and are not intended to capture the full set of rules that govern health professions. In fact, these statutes only describe the things that vary from college to college. As I've mentioned, all the processes and expectations that apply equally to all professions are within the Health Professions Procedural Code, which is in the RHPA, a part of every profession-specific act. Profession-specific acts are essential to the RHPA model because they give the capacity to manage the differences between professions and establish a consistent regulatory framework. Some of the most significant things that profession-specific acts do are to establish the regulatory college for the profession, establish the governing council of the college and define its composition, set out the profession's scope of practice, and set out the full or partial controlled acts that members of that profession are authorized to perform, although some professions have no authorized acts. The final thing they do is to define the restricted titles that members of the profession are permitted to use. Next, I'll move on and cover regulations under the profession-specific acts. The RHPA gives each profession the authority to make regulation. This promotes consistency and the college's capacity to make rules specific to their professions because regulations can be based on profession-specific requirements. Regulations have the force of law as they are made under the authority of a statute. They are developed by colleges, but they must be approved by government. The Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care has considerable control over what regulations are approved as they review the college's regulations when they're submitted and they assign specific priority. Although colleges can establish a variety of regulations under the authority of their profession-specific acts and the code, most colleges focus on developing regulations that are essential to the governance of their professions. For many professions, the focus is on regulations related to registration, professional conduct, and quality assurance. 
In registration regulations, colleges typically set out the categories of registration available in the profession and then lay out the necessary qualifications for these registration categories. Professional misconduct regulations are the rules that usually define what members of professions should do or not do. Not only do they serve as useful guidance for members, they are critically important to colleges as these rules set the standard for what colleges can enforce through the complaints, inquiries, and discipline processes. Without misconduct rules, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to use the investigation and hearing process to enforce standards of practice. Quality assurance regulations give colleges the authority to undertake quality assurance programs required by the RHP model. Profession-specific regulations allow colleges to tailor the program requirements to the profession in keeping with the minimum requirements of the model and also allow colleges the authority to require their members to meet these specific obligations. Other important regulation-making authorities include the ability to make regulations defining conflict of interest, setting out advertising rules, and setting out record-keeping requirements. Colleges often concentrate on core regulations because of the difficulties associated with making regulations. The process can be time and labor intensive. Colleges must do the background work, distribute consultation documents to members for comment, incorporate these comments, consider the regulation at council, and then submit the regulation for government approval. Member consultation is a critical aspect of self-regulation. This is only the first stage in the process. Once a regulation has been submitted to government, it can often take a year or more for the regulation to be considered for approval. The delays associated with regulation development and approval mean that sometimes the regulations are out of date by the time the process is complete. Because of this, some colleges turn to alternative rulemaking authorities to ensure that their rules are as current as possible. Alternatives often include using standards and guidelines. This brings us to bylaws. The authority each profession has to make bylaws is similar to the authority it has to make regulations. This promotes consistency in the model because all colleges have the same authority. The authority that colleges have to make bylaws are quite far-ranging. They include establishing the administrative processes for colleges such as banking, finances and audit, the rules for council elections, meetings, committee composition and councillor conduct, the rules that guide members' conduct, including codes of ethics and requiring them to provide information to the public, and the setting out of registration fees. In the order of legislative priority, bylaws fall below statutes and regulations, although they are still rules that colleges can enforce. The decision on how to enforce bylaws is typically made on a case-by-case -case basis. A fairly common enforcement mechanism is the use of a court injunction against the violator. However, the college's investigation and hearing process is another option. Standards and guidelines provide guidance to members that may or may not be part of the legislative framework. This depends on the point of view of you and your legal counsel. The RHPA model does not specifically provide colleges with the legislative authority to enforce standards or guidelines. However, the code does, when defining the objects of the colleges in Section 3, include a requirement that colleges develop standards for certificates of registration, quality practice, continuing competence, the performance of controlled acts, professional ethics, and for changes in professional environments and technology. The statutory link to guidelines is tentative, although it also does exist. Section 84 of the Code defines colleges' requirements for preventing sexual abuse and indicates that these programs are to include guidelines for the conduct of members with their patients. In Section 95, the provision to incorporate a document by reference into a regulation or ruling incorporation indicates that these documents may include guidelines relating to standards of practice of the profession. Regrettably, the ability of the college to use this authority has been limited by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care interpretation of the provision. So while standards and guidelines are mentioned in the RHPA framework, legal advisors suggest that these kind of documents, when developed by regulators, do not in fact have the force of law behind them. When a standard or guideline is used by a college in a proceeding, it's generally not sufficient on its own. Colleges must provide expert testimony to indicate that the expectations defined in the standard are consistent with what right-minded professional members actually do in practice. Okay, let's take a moment and review what we've learned so far. What do you believe the best answer is? The RHPA sets out the minister's responsibility to administer the Act, establishes the Health Professions Regulatory Advisory Council and the Health Professions Appeal and Review Board, defines controlled acts, 
contains the restricted titles for all regulated health professions? The answer is the first, second, and third points. Again, choose the best answers. Profession-specific acts. Establish each health professions college and its governing council. Define the scope of practice of the profession they govern. List the controlled acts that professions are authorized to perform, if they can perform controlled acts. Has the code deemed to be part of them? Or all of the above? The best answer is five, all of the above. 